Lila Kasich, I'm part of the Citywide PTO, and up here is Nancy Troll. And thank you very much for coming and meeting our uh, Board of Education candidates. And the other part of the Citywide PTO, we have Janet Hamilton, and we have Terry McCarthy. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we can go around to it. That'd be right? Okay, very good. So we're going to start off tonight. We're going to have the, the candidates actually introduce themselves to you, and we're going to start with uh, Daniel. Should I come down there? Just from this right there. Hi, good evening. My name is Dan Rosemark. I'm an attorney here in Danbury. I um, I also currently serve on the Candlewood Lake Authority as a delegate for Danbury. I moved here in 2003. I have uh, two children that one that attends the uh, Danbury Public School System, another one attends a private school. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and I want to thank the PTO for putting this together this evening. Um, we have an opportunity to um, sit on a board like this and make an impact and make an influence. Um, we get to be a part of the decision making process where a lot of people don't have that opportunity. Um, so I'm, I'm very thankful that I'm here this evening uh, to be able to do that and hopefully I can uh, show you through the through the time that I'll be as a, uh, a board member, hopefully, that I will um, make sure that I'm always fighting for our children and for their best interest, uh, no matter what. Thank you. Working right on the line, right? <laughs> right down the line. Awesome. Um, I am Miguel Palmeiras, and I am a candidate, as you know, for the Board of Education. I'm a Brazilian-American immigrant in the Danbury area, and I am a proud product of the Danbury Public School System, so I went to this very school, Broadway Middle School, and Danbury High School as well. And I'm a parent of a child in our public school system. Um, he goes to Caillou, was here earlier, some of you got the joy of meeting him or hearing his little voice. Um, he goes to Cottage Street uh, in a special education program. Um, I'm really passionate about our community in Danbury, and I've had the pleasure to serve it in different capacities. Um, as a volunteer and as a professional. Um, I worked as a home visitor for the Danbury Head Start program. I was a member of the regional YMCA um, board, also a member of the United Way of, of Fairfield County Emerging Leaders Council, and also a community member of the Danbury High School Governance Board for about two years. I've been the editor and partner of the Tribuna newspaper here in town for the past eight years, and that's an English and Portuguese and Spanish publication that was founded by my mother, who's sitting here, hi mom, hi dad. Um, right up there. And our mission in the Tribuna is to build bridges and join cultures and facilitate conversations in the community with all people in our area. And it's been a blast to do that job for the past eight years. I was appointed to a state commission in 2013, the Latino Puerto Rican Affairs Commission, which is a nonpartisan commission mandated to make recommendations to the Connecticut State Legislature and the governor regarding Latino issues. And most recently, I served in the Connecticut Legislature Language and Acquisition, Education and Equity um, Working Group, which um, was charged to review the way that English language learner education is funded in our state. But one of my proudest achievements has been the completion of one year of R23 intervention therapy for autism with my son. And I had the pleasure to see with my own eyes what early intervention, early childhood education is capable of doing and have the experience to be my son's first teacher, and that was amazing. And I also become very aware of the challenges that he's going to face ahead as we plan for his future as a learner. I believe that due to my volunteer, professional, and personal experience, I'll be a very positive addition to this board in communicating with the Latino community, other immigrant groups, and the general community in getting them up to be a part of the table and a part of the conversation. A district's mission is to develop in all children skills, attitudes, values which enable them to live a productive and self-fulfilling life and engage as responsible citizens in a global society. I would have nothing more, I would like nothing more than to have the honor of your vote for me to be able to help our district to fulfill that mission. So if you could please vote for me, I would appreciate it and I would love to work for you and with you for all of our children here in Danbury. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Frederick Barat, and I am running for the Board of Education as well with these fine people. Uh, I am a product of Danbury School System. I was born and raised here in Danbury. 
Um, my brother and my sister as well, products of the Danbury public education system. Uh, and you know, Danbury Public Schools have really done a lot uh, for me growing up, and that's part of the reason why you know, I want to I want this opportunity to give back to you know, Danbury Public Schools and do my part. Uh, after graduating from Danbury High School, I attended the University of Connecticut for undergrad, uh, and then I immediately began uh, law school after that. And now I'm a practicing attorney here in Connecticut and in New York. Uh, I serve on the Western Connecticut Federal Credit Union uh, Board of Directors. Um, during a, a small, short period of time after law school, I actually spent time substitute teaching in, in all the schools in Danbury, uh, which I thought was a wonderful experience. It really gave me an opportunity to, to see the different schools and, and you know, the different resources available there and, and just you know, all the things that were going on uh, across the city of Danbury. And also around that time, <laughs> substitute teaching in the high school, I also got to deal with the plight of students and their, their cell phones. But, uh, it's, it was a wonderful opportunity, and you know, there's really nothing I would like more than to, you know, come back as a member of the board of education, and uh, you know, help to help to keep the schools going in the right direction. I think that Danbury Public Schools are are excellent schools. Uh, I think that sometimes they don't necessarily get the best reputation from neighboring towns for whatever reason. Uh, but I mean, for example, by attending you know, Cambridge High School and the coursework that was available to me uh, at the time when I was there, I was actually able to save a year of college and graduate a year early from college because of all the AP classes that were that were made available to us. So I mean, that's just a, you know one small example of what Danbury Public Schools have done for me and just the opportunities that are available to uh, the students. So again, thank you very much for having me this evening. Um, and both like to the support on election day. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gladys Cooper. I've been a resident of Danbury for 45 years. I'm a member of New Hope Baptist Church, where I've been a member there for 41 years. And I have been past um, leader of the choir, the youth choir at New Hope Baptist Church. And I have served on various committees at New Hope Baptist Church. And as I look around, I say, why am I sitting here? We have all these young people up here. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to thank Citywide PTO for putting this together. But as I continue my strive to, to be the best person that I can be, I will continue to uh, press on to be uh, on the Denver Board of Ed. I believe, and it has always been my passion, and I, as I have sit around over the, the many years that I have been on the board, I believe all children can learn. And I think at some point, we need to improve our communication with those people that are connected to our children and not look at a child simply because they live over here versus uh, living in another place that you think is, is, is most appropriate. I've served under five superintendents they have the fabulous jobs. And uh, as we continue to move forward, I hope that we can continue to make our school system the best that there is. Um, I was instrumental. I served on several committees uh, during my tenure on the board. Um, at one point, uh, I was very instrumental in making sure that there was a representative from, uh, from ACE uh, that would sit on a student that would sit on the board to give a report as it was a student sitting from Danbury High School because I feel it, I believe that you can't have two communities. We can, but you cannot make a good sense of what you're doing if you have one set one side of the community saying these kids are better and the other kids the other side saying they're not. So instrumental we I was very Instrumental in asking the superintendent at that time, why is it that we can't have a representative from ACE to come and give a report to the board just like from Danbury High School? So that was done. Uh, the other thing that I'm very uh, proud of our system is that when you present something to the leadership and you present it in a way that's um, not an arrogant way, they will listen to you and get back to you. 
Uh, my son, who's 32 years old, is a part of the Denver school system, and I'm very proud of him. And um, along with that, um, I ask that you will continue to support the thing that you believe is being done right in our uh, Danbury school system. So again, I thank the PTO for this, this, this uh, opportunity to come before you tonight, and I hope that you will continue to support the things and the right things for the Danbury Board of Education. Hello, my name is Holly Robinson. Um, I've been a Danbury resident for um, almost 10 years. I have lived several places, but I actually grew up mostly in Brookfield, so I know the area very well. Um, I have two children in Danbury Public Schools in first and third grade, um, and I worked as a student teacher, a substitute teacher, uh, for a period of time in my career as well. Um, I practiced as an attorney locally and all around Connecticut for 12 years, uh, and now I work for Yale University um, negotiating contracts for their cancer center. Um, so I, I believe in education. I was raised in a family of uh, people who are very proud of public education. My mother uh, is a superintendent, still active here in Connecticut, formerly Newtown, now in Stratford. Um, and my father was the chairman of the Board of Education in Brookfield for many years. Um, I went through public schools. My parents refused to think that public schools could not offer what private schools could. And I believe the same in Danbury. I think that when I look at some of the school systems around us, Danbury has some unique abilities to provide things for these students that some of these smaller districts don't. I think we have amazing diversity in a collective environment that I'm proud that my kids are in the programs that they're in, and I look at the programs that they could be in as they go through the school system. Um, I'm running for the board because I think things, there are challenges ahead for us that we're gonna have to be creative. Um, but what I do for a living is, is get things done. I, I don't believe in um, you know, fighting over it. I believe in trying to find solutions, whether it be something that I might not agree with when it starts, I'm willing to hear ideas. Um, and one of the things I've learned in my career is that sometimes just listening to other ideas can spark something that you never saw coming. So I like to encourage everybody to be part of the process. I hope that I can be part of the process to actually bring things to the table and listen to the community and the parents. Um, and my final thing is, like I said, I believe this school system could go up in the rankings and do the right things for our children that they have been doing. And I've seen some products from Danbury Public Schools that have done amazing things that they couldn't have done in other districts. So I think we can keep doing the right things right and come up with solutions for the things that are challenging us ahead. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pat Johnston, and I've lived in Danbury for 35 years. I have two children in the Danbury Public Schools, and I have uh, been a member of the Zoning Commission in Danbury. I've been a member, I'm presently a member of the Planning Commission. Um, I work for uh, on the Bustonic River. I'm the chief electrician uh, and run seven hydroelectric facilities. Um, as well as uh, I have a small business, and I negotiate um, on behalf of uh, all of our contracts there. And I felt that throughout uh, my career there and throughout my time on the different boards here that I've worked to help create situations, compromise, get things done. Um, I basically try and fix things. That's what I do at work. That's what I like to do when I'm on boards, and I find that it's a great way to give back to the community. I, I love the Danbury system, I love the Danbury community, and I think that this is a shining example in what's now become sort of a state in decline. I think Danbury is, I know there's issues even with uh, our population growing here. Um, in comparison to most other towns, people are fleeing from them. And I think that there's a lot, of, um, a, lot of, a lot of opportunity, a lot of problems to be solved. And looking at it, I, I thought long and hard about whether or not I could give something back and do something on this board. And I know it's a challenging position. And there's a great deal of talent up here looking for opportunities to do it. And, and I, 
if I'm elected, I hope that I can do the best job for the city of Danbury that I can possibly do. This is a this is a great honor to be even considered to do this position, and and I would do everything I could to help move our school system on behalf of all of our children, mine and everybody out there's, and on behalf of the city. I know that there's always perpetual issues trying to get things done and I hope that my previous abilities and working things through can help out and help bring things to fruition and maybe make things a little bit better for our kids going forward. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks very much for coming out. Greatly appreciate your time. I want to thank the PTO for organizing this and especially acknowledge some people within the uh, within the audience, some uh, some board members, which were kind enough to come out, inclusive of the uh, chairperson, and then also the executive board, Dr. Sale and Joe and Ann. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, my name is Richard Hawley. I'm a lifelong Danbury resident, born and raised here, graduate of 1976 from DHS. My two girls came up through the system. Uh, currently for serving my first term, finishing up my first term, and I just hope for your support as far as to continue the good work which we've done so far. To Frederick's point, not enough good things are said about the system. This is a phenomenal program and a phenomenal system within the city. Within the city. And we should just continue to grow and expand it. Thank you. Let us have applause for our candidates. We have some questions. I'm going to start off, Nancy. All right. All right. These issues for the can. Uh, sorry. These questions for the candidates. What issues are most important to you for Danbury? What if? What problem would you fix in Danbury if you were elected? say problem, but I think uh, our funding that is not ECS funding, that is not being given properly the amount to them here, I think we need to continue to push that, push it, and make sure that when our people get elected um, on the common council, and I'm going to say this, you know, make sure that um, our um, elected official uh, support our school budget when we go down and present our budget at City Hall. But the main thing is make sure that we can get some ECS funding. The budget is always a top priority to make sure that we have the type of finances that we need to continue the great educational program that we have in our school system. Quick question, Gladys. I don't know if everyone, everyone knows what the ECS formula is. Could you explain real quickly? It's the edu educational cost sharing funding that comes from the state to the schools. And it's more or less, I think, and, and, and our administrators is out there, um, and, and um, it's the funding for children in uh, low-income areas or minority stature or whatever lunch, uh, freedom to do lunch. And the, the formula, no one really understands the formula, but there's a formula. And then they're not getting their share. <laughs> Yes, Gladys, you're right. There's something wrong with this ECS, ECS formula for sure. Um, I think I think one of one of the biggest um, issues I think exactly um, when when we think of all the other underlying issues with public school system, whether it's overcrowding, um, whether it's the quality of education. Um, you know, not not all um, parents may feel that things are going exactly the way that they want it to be. Um, a lot of parents have great experiences in our school system, so. When we all look at the one underlining issue that's been, it's always going to go down to funding and money. And I think that we're, as taxpayers, also well aware that we're already paying 70 cents to the dollar in municipal funds towards education. So I think that as, as one of the members of the board, one of the things I'd like to play an integral part of, it's really shifting the board's energy to do some more advocacy in, Dan in, in Hartford about Danbury not just directly with our Danbury delegation, but with other legislators as well, to make the case 
for not just the unfreezing of the current ECS formula, but actually a new formula to be in place. Um, you know, the, the ECS formula that we have um, needs to be completely scrapped and we get a new one that's fair. Right now, Denver is $30 million underfunded by the state of Connecticut, and uh, that is just completely unfair. Our children deserve better, and that's one of the things I would like to get involved. The second thing that I'm, it's really close to my heart, obviously, is communication with all parents and parent involvement. And um, I believe that when we look at the numbers, two very special things we have to pay attention to is that over 50% of our children are at free and reduced lunch, and 40% of our school system identifies themselves as Latino. We need to bring the Latino community to the table. We need to meet them where they are. They're 40% of the pie. And I would love to be a voice and a connector to make sure that they're a part of the work that we're trying to do to make sure that their children excel and really make the best out of their opportunity in our school system. These are all great issues um, that they're pointing out. Money is always going to be an issue. Um, I work on the, as a delegate, as I said, for the Kennewood Lake Authority. We are funded by the five surrounding towns and we're tasked to manage the, the Kennewood Lake. Um, we're always, again, pressed for, for funds and what we try to do is look inside too to see what we can do with the money that we're given. Um, we're at years not given any additional increases in funds from the towns. We understand that it's a great asset for the community, but it takes second place to other bigger initiatives throughout the, uh, the cities and the towns. So what I look to, I look a little bit differently. I want to understand the process and how we can improve that process for money and acquiring more. But I also want to look at what we've been doing to date, and I want to see if we can improve on that if we can, as Holly pointed out, she negotiates contracts, I do as well. Um, there would be a problem if somebody else on the other side saw two contracting attorneys trying to negotiate a vendor agreement on their be on behalf. So there's other opportunities. Uh, unfortunately, I am not in, have been involved in the past, so it's hard for me to speak about certain issues that I don't know about yet, but once I get involved, as many of these members are going to attest to, once we get involved, we sink in and we, and we really start to understand the process and see where we can improve it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hi, Pat Johnston. Um, and, and I wanted to agree um, while the statements were going regarding um, the funding. And as has been on the news, if, uh, if uh, any of you have heard it, that the budget is being cut dramatically at the state level and the governor has decided to exclude the municipalities from any of those budget talks, which leads me to believe that that is going to mean that's where the cuts are coming from our teachers, from our firemen, from our policemen. And I can tell you whether or not I get elected to this board, I write letters. I like writing letters to our representatives. I hope everybody out there does the same thing because the key, the people on this board any of these people that you're going to elect, whether it's me or not, they're gonna come in here and do the best that they can do for the city of Danbury. But a lot of that hand is handcuffed by the people up in Hartford when they decide that they're gonna cut our budgets here and we pay in, as was brought up by Manuela, that the amount of money that this area pays in versus the amount of money we get back is very disproportionate against us. And I would like to, if nothing else, have other people go out there, write to your representatives, write to your state senators, write to the governor, and tell them we need to be involved. We need to have the money that's being paid in in taxes not put towards pet projects, but to support our children and our municipalities here. That's where the money belongs. Thank you. I guess since we're talking about money, I might as well keep that going forward. Um, I, I agree with it, what's being said. I think that Danbury's underfunded, but I think that I, I'm trying to look at it from a different side of the coin and that we might not be successful and we're going to continue these, you know, um, all of these pushes to, to get more funding. But I think in the meantime, we need to become more creative in our solutions as well as to where it's going. Um, I think that we need to find ways to encourage teachers to love teaching, and that doesn't cost a lot. Um, I think we need to find ways to compete with, you know, the magnet school by allowing 
um, different sort of projects that could be low cost projects and creative ideas from teachers and administrators in school to kind of encourage things within the district, between parents and kids, um, between teachers and administrators, between administrators and superintendent, just, just have other flows of communication and the creative process that we can use, you know, money-free solutions as well. Um, and do I have a list of them yet? No. Um, but that's what I, I want to encourage more people to participate in the process with as well. If we're going to stand here and say that we don't have the money to do it, um, I'd like to hear ideas of how we can do it differently then. Um, and, and do what we can so the kids can get as good as education as they can in, in Greenwich or Woodbridge or Westport that apparently has more parents delivering things to the school. I think we have enough people here and enough parents that are passionate about their children's education that we can kind of overcome some of these hurdles with finances as well. So that's my perspective. I guess I'm last. <laughs> Uh, the biggest obstacle that's currently facing us is population growth and also achievement gap. Funding is always going to be an issue. It will always be forever and ever. And to everyone's point, until we can get, we can get some additional substantial financial help from the state, we're going to continue to face a, a budgetary, you know, budget, budget crisis. But in the same respect, we're growing at a rate of 2% per year. That, that's unheard of within the area. It's only one of three municipalities within the entire state that's growing and no one at that rate. And secondly, is, as I said, the, uh, the influx, just, just the population shift. And then lastly, the, the, again, the achievement, the achievement gap, that we've got to do a better job of identifying and bringing the remedial class up to standard. Thank you. Money's a big issue, everybody agrees. You know, I'm just, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to wait you out. Uh, no, money is a, is a big issue, and you know, the, the Board of Ed needs to advocate on behalf of the city of Danbury to try and uh, obtain the most amount of funds that we possibly can from the state. But at the end of the day, there's only so much that we can do on behalf of the school system to obtain those funds, and we need the help of all the members of Danbury, you know, whether they have children or not in schools. I mean, the less funding that we get from the state, you know, the more funding that we need to generate here in Danbury to, to fill the gap, and it just raises everybody's taxes. So we just need the help of every Danbury resident to, to try and uh, bridge that gap, you know, speak to our representatives and do whatever we can up in Hartford to obtain the funds that we need. Uh, but again, like Holly said, you know, there's no guarantee that we're gonna be able to obtain the funds that way, and there's certainly no guarantee that you know, we'll be able to generate the tax revenue to even you know, compensate for that. So we need to do the best that we can you know, with what we have at the same time. Uh, one of the things that's always looked at as a big, uh, I guess as a big cost and a big expense is technology in schools. Uh, I mean, certainly, you know, MacBooks and PCs and iPads, they all cost money. I mean, it's expensive, it's a, it's a big investment, and the, the turnover of technology is great. But there's also uh, a lot of opportunities that, you know, you can leverage, you know, the internet and technology to, you know, hopefully achieve certain things that uh, you wouldn't ordinarily be able to achieve without, uh, without that resource. For example, I remember when I was in Danbury High School, I, I, I forget exactly how many courses are in, the, are in the course handbook, and I was a little bit of a nerd at the time. You know, I used to try and take as many AP classes and honors classes and whatever I could, and I come to find out that a lot of those classes, you know, weren't available because you know you didn't have you know the amount of students that, that wanted to take those classes, or you didn't have the resources to pay for a teacher you know, to teach those courses, and you know, there are ways to you know bridge that gap and deliver those resources to students when, you know, if there's that lone student that wants to take an astronomy class and they don't offer it or whatever the course might be, you know, it's, it's great to be able to do that. And then also, another thing that's always bothered me has been uh, when a kid gets suspended or, you know, and, and they're 
away from class for an extended period of time. I mean, there's, you're really setting a student back big time by, by taking them out of the classroom. And, you know, we're able to, you know, do something to technology, you know, with technology where we can still deliver, you know, the student his coursework and, you know, day-to-day -day classes. Um, you know, I, that, that's another example of how, you know, we can kind of use technology to, you know, hopefully improve things and, you know, maybe uh, not always as an expense, but maybe as a way to, to cut costs and help our students do the best they can. I'll be very brief. Um, as we talk about money, yes, money will always be a problem, but as our population shift and as the state continue to put mandates on school systems, then if they're going to continue to put mandates on school system, then the state needs to come down and come up with the money to help the school system do that. And then as we come to our local municipalities, you know, uh, the board can't go every year as far as cutting our budget. We need the resources and the fund to continue the educational process that we have in place. Yes, uh, uh, funding is and will always be a problem, but the state continuously to make changes, but they don't send the money down to the local ambassador. Okay, I'm sorry, but I, I'm getting kind of involved now. So, um, and, and our achievement, yeah, and, and I think our school system, matter of fact, I know that our school system is not 100% as far as closing the achievement gap, but since I have been on the board, it has come from point A all the way up to 100, not quite 100. And we get those reports as a board member, uh, I think about um, every three months. So you, you, again, you have the opportunity to ask those questions and get those numbers if you're concerned. But I, again, I think we have a great school system and we all can work together, uh, write letters or do whatever we can uh, to the state, our legislators, to ask them to just look at this one. We had a meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, about the ECS funding, and, and we didn't have the, the turnout uh, that we expected, but how can you sort of put something in perspective to make parents understand when, you know, you have to come to board meetings, you have to understand all this abbreviation of certain things, and, and I, when I started as a new person, I think I came to board meetings close to two years before I was a, uh, uh, asked to run for the board. My main thing was not to get on the board. My thing was to understand the process and understand what if I ever decided to run for the board, what I would be getting myself in. And we have things that's going on in our school system. As a board member, there would be things uh, going on that you know you might not get the answer that you want, but it's the answer that we have hired people and pay them money to come up with the right answer and pre present that to the board. So, uh, you know, uh, just being a board member, it's not just sitting there silent and there's a way to ask the question and, and get the answer. And if you're not happy with the answer, you keep asking until they get the answer that you uh, are happy with. So, uh, let's keep saying that the state you want to make mandates, hey, someone got to give us some money to keep up with those mandates. Okay, thank you. With our Another question. With our current funding model, um, and I think Richard actually started to talk about this, uh, we do have an overcrowded situation, and we do have a rapidly growing population of students. So with our current funding model, what are your thoughts about how we might tackle that, the, those issues of overcrowding and a rapidly growing student population? Who would like to uh, take a turn at this? great thing. It shows that people love being here. They feel welcome here. But we also want it to be a place where every child can go into that classroom and feel like they have gotten a quality education on that particular day. How do we stop it and make sure we don't, I guess we don't want to stop it. 
Because if we stop it, then something is going wrong. People are moving away. And our schools are overcrowded. Yes, they are. But when our administrators bring uh, a suggestion to us, we need to listen to it as board members. And hopefully, um, we will come up with a suggestion that would uh, rectify the situation. Um, you know, overcrowding is overcrowding. And we have to work out those avenues to uh, make the best opportunity happen for that particular area that is overcrowded. Well, I don't necessarily have a solution either. Um, I, I think Gladys has a really good point. And I, I, my understanding too in the ebbs and flows of student population is that you can have you know, a, a big influx of students one year and then the next year have um, you know, a very small group um, that comes in. You know, if you're looking at kindergarten numbers, they can fluctuate at a given time. And you can move students around like we did um, at a Mill Ridge and then a year later have a very different um, number of students that you're looking at. Um, I mean, the first answer would be we build another school or we find more space in the city of Danbury that we can make, um, you know, take other programs out of the schools and create more space inside schools. Um, you know, that's not always possible and that costs a lot of money. Um, but I think that you know one of the things is having to figure out how to have almost like a very fluid um, transition in some of these schools that we can look at, we can try to figure out looking at kindergarten as part of it. I mean, I know students come in at every age, um, but trying to figure out maybe having elementary schools be a little bit more fluid, um, and that you know the process of moving kids and the dis redistricting might happen. Um, for, for a couple of years here and there to, to get through those ages um, and then maybe expand you know some of the classes in the, in the upper schools but it's it's not a solution that's easy to resolve without uprooting kids and moving them or redistricting um, or building another school or finding other space um, this is there's I think Stratford is one of the other schools districts that has this problem actually um, this is not a problem that any other school district has, so in, anywhere near us. So, um, you know, one of the things that, again, and I, I want to say that parent involvement matters, is that, you know, what do they want to see for their kids? And we can talk about classroom size, we can talk about kids, you know, having classes in different parts of different buildings throughout the day. Parents might not want to talk about moving their kids um, when you're here, when you're there. there. So um, it's, it's not an easy answer, and not, I don't necessarily have one, but I think that you can find ways to, to kind of make things a little bit more flexible so that these kids don't feel overcrowded. It's, it makes a big difference. Um, my family comes from you know, Southern California where there are, there are areas where we had, you know, they had 45 kids in classroom and one teacher. And you can't, you know, these kids, probably 15 of those kids or 20 of those kids aren't getting nearly the attention and the help and the one-on-one -on -one time that they need. And it makes a big difference. And anybody who is involved in early childhood education, anybody who's been a teacher, anybody that has kids, understands that, that though some kids need a little bit more time um, and a little bit more attention and effort in a classroom than others. And we can't let those kids fall apart, fall aside, and we can't let the kids that don't need the attention fall by the wayside either. Um, so it, it, overcrowding is a big problem. And hopefully, I, as everyone has said before, there's a lot of very qualified people <coughs> here that hopefully can help the superintendent and some of the administrators come up with solutions. Mandela? Call me a dreamer, but I still think the problem is mine. <laughs> when you look at the overcrowding issue, when you look at every other possible suggestion for any other possible solution, all the roads are going to lead to Hartford. All the roads are. What I think we need to do when we're looking at the overcrowding issue in our schools, we're looking at parent involvement. We need to create a groundswell in Danbury. We need to start with our board to get parents to advocate for our town in Hartford. We need to get parents involved. We need to believe that our voice is collectively saying that it's not fair and no, that if we get that kind of support from you, parents, as members of the board, and we knock on every legislator's door, not just ours, we have to believe in the democratic process that that will have some sort of an impact. I'm, I'm not going to, to, to sit here and think that it doesn't work because as here as a candidate, I'm here because I believe the democratic process works. 
So, as also as a small business owner, you know, um, my parents and I, we, we've run the Tribuna for 16 years here in Danbury. Um, we are a, we do a three language, English, Portuguese, and Spanish newspaper, 40 pages, we're three people. So as far as creative solutions and working the shoestring budget and trying to make things work, I get it. But at the end of the day, I still have to pay bills. And I still have to figure out how we're going to do it. So I think that it's time for us to realize that whatever plans we have, whether it's building a new school, looking for creative solutions, in the world we live in today, it's going to take money. And we need to let Hartford know that they cannot ask us to pay any more than we're already paying, and that they need to take their share of the responsibility when it comes to Danbury. Danbury deserves better, and I believe there are collective voices as community activists, as parents of children in our school system, can actually create an impact and change when we knock on the doors and say, it's not fair. I just, I just wanted to completely agree with that. That was my standpoint before. Um, the Danbury High School expansion shows that, you know, that's, that's where we need to be, but that's the high school. We've got a lot of schools before that. And that expansion is, is for a reason because the swell is coming from down below and those kids are moving up. And there's only so many kids that you can put in a classroom. Holly brought up the point, you can't teach 45 kids in a classroom. It just doesn't work. And if we need to build another school, or we need to build an addition on other schools, or we need another elementary school, that's what's gonna have to happen at some point. And the problem is, as it's, as it's been brought up here time and time again, which is the perpetual problem, you can't build schools without the money to do it. And the problem being that we're underfunded here from the state and that that's what everybody here has to go back, elect the people on this board that you want, elect the people to the other boards that you want, elect the legislators to the state and to the governor's office that are going to help our children to get, to get the schools that we need to even out the funding. We need the money here to build better schools and bigger schools. If we're going to have if we're going to have a two percent growth of population, you know, in five years it's ten percent. You know, it's it's there's a lot of that's another classroom in each school. You know, and there's only so much room. We, we can't teach the kids in closets. You know, so that's that's going to be the problem. New schools, more teachers. If our if our city continues to grow, the money is going to have to come, and the tax base will grow with that, but not enough. We need funding from the state as well. So uh, just two points to follow up on that. Um, one is, I think a couple of years ago, we just closed one of the elementary schools and um, we, we uh, redistrict, we leased, I think it was um, Stadler Road and, and where my son goes to Great Plain, we, we uh, remodified the district a little bit. But I thought one of the schools had, had, had um, there's not overcrowding in every, every grade level and every school, you know, in the elementary, at least at the elementary level. Now, in middle school and in the high school, I think the response there to uh, building a new annex for the high school. Um, but, but overcrowding is a product of uh, you plan as best as you can, but you can't build a school and hope that they will come. So that's, that's where you're always throttling between the demand and the supply of students. Um, the question was, how do we feel about it? I think it was, I think it's terrible. Um, what I would like to do, if I was uh, on the board, I would like to understand what have we been doing um, in addition to what you know. What what are we? What is our collective thought on uh, how are other school districts handling it? Not just maybe in Connecticut, but around the country. What are they? What have they been doing? Is there some best practices we can look at? Again, money is always going to be the overarching requirement but we also have to just deal with what we have uh, if we don't get the, the most money that we can possibly get. Um, so I, I'm always looking at, uh, is there other ways, what, what else can we do? Agreed, we can't put them in a closet, but is there other spots for them to find? So. Thank you. Great question. Uh, yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up through these schools, and I've seen a lot of changes along the way. Um, for example, when I was in elementary school, they, you know, they 
they've restructured the schools and they moved the sixth graders out of the elementary schools and into the middle school. Um, at some point during my, my time in school, Roberts Avenue just, you know, <laughs> stopped, you know, shut down and, you know, they made the changes they made there. Uh, this auditorium was not here when I was here at Broadview. Uh, I believe when I was in high school they, they, they put this place up. Uh, and then when I was in, and when I was at Danbury High School, they put in a new addition, the, the Science Wing, uh, at the time, which was a great addition, and you know, had a lot of great features. I, I think at the end of the day, you know, we are constrained by finances, by, you know, we only have so much and we can only do so much with it. And I think, you know, we need to be creative, and I think when we, you know, when we expand and when we deal with overcrowding and situations like that, we need to do it responsibly and, uh, and, and very carefully. When I was in at Danbury High School as well, uh, my freshman class started off at 770 students. Uh, by graduation day, we had 660 students. Uh, but also by the first day of school, my senior year, there were a thousand freshmen uh, at Danbury High School. And we had over 3,000 kids at that time. And I don't think we're that far off from where we were then. Uh, but it's always, you know, overcrowding is always going to be a concern. It's always going to be an issue. Uh, we used to use it as an excuse as to why we were late for class. But, uh, you know, it's something that needs to get dealt with. We need to do it the best we can with what we have. And we need to make sure that we don't get too crazy and put up new schools and make big changes. And then all of a sudden, you know, we start dealing with the same problems as our neighbors and, you know, start losing students. I mean, I agree with Gladys. I think. It's a great problem to have, you know, people coming to Danbury wanting to raise their families and you know, put their kids through school here. And we just need to keep Danbury an attractive place for families and you know, make sure that we're you know, using our resources carefully. Okay. Can we have one last question? And then we're going to see if anybody else has questions. That's fine, if I may. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Totally agree with everyone up here that, you know what, the bottom line is that it's got to be a grassroots effort to gain additional support and funding as far as we're concerned. But same respect, I'm a realist. And the money's not there, folks. We've been at it for four years, hounding them to change that ECS formula. All right? The money's not there. So we, personally, I would like to take a completely different tack as a Board of Education member and give the finance to the city that I think as a role of the Board of Education should be on policy and student achievement. That we currently estimate, I estimate that we, as, we spend at least 45 to 50% of our time doing budget and doing finance. We shouldn't, in my opinion. We should not. That should fall on the city's shoulders. That we should control and drive <coughs> policy and achievement gap. Thank you. Thank you. So our last question is, um, uh, high quality education, that's really what we want. Uh, how do you envision that for IBM, for um, Terry's future study? <laughs> there you go. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, we want high quality education. That's really what we want. Uh, how do you envision that for Danbury's future? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that first. Um, I think it starts with high quality early education. Um, I think that it's very important that we look at our children as they enter the school system and understand the impact and how it saves us money, so much money in the long run when we invest in quality early childhood education. So that would be my, my first um, you know, vision for Dan Ray would be a, an even more robust and even more expanded early education program in Danbury so that all of our children have access to that, so they have a good start. And then from that point, also through the middle school years, enhancing their social and emotional support, because that's really when children need that extra boost of social emotional support through the middle school years. And then creating a high school level program that we already have and we seem to build upon because we already have very good things happening at the high school, especially the new education initiative of early college. But Continue to support programs that allows the students to make the choice that has a good, strong curriculum that if they want to continue their education into a university or a college, or if they want to become 
a technical student in learn a trade that they have the academic background to make that choice and for that to be a successful one in their lives. So that we're allowing them to look at both options in their lives with respect and honor, um, you know, because they're all honorable. But I think it really starts with early childhood education and us understanding the cost savings that it comes from investing in children loving to learn at a very, very early age. There's less money spent on remedial courses, there's less money spent in other activities when you put your dollars first in early childhood education. I, I actually agree very much with early childhood education as being a big part of it. Um, I think that, you know, I, I know I'm staying with the very same theme tonight um, with utilizing the resources that you have. Um, and I think that, that Danbury has a unique ability um, with what we do have here. When I look at the resources we have and some of the, even the special ed classes, some of the, the positions that we have that other school districts don't. Um, what makes great schools when we look at achievement levels, when we look at, I mean, I don't even want to talk about test scores, it's a whole other topic. Um, children need to be engaged, they need to be interested in learning, and overcrowding of classrooms is probably the biggest problem with keeping a kid engaged. Um, so that's, that's step one, is figuring out how to make them want to learn, how to make them love to learn. And a lot of it comes from curriculum, it comes with the teachers being involved in curriculum building, it comes from um, you know, the top down, making sure the curriculum is geared to keep the children in, children engaged instead of just, you know, going through the motions of, of you know, what colleges are looking for. Um, it should be something that allows for more creativity um, and a process to allow the children to be part of it. And I think that those are all things that don't really cost money. Um, we have people that can, that are designed, that are in this district to work on curriculum and to work on children involvement. And we talk about parental involvement, and I, I, that's a hard thing to achieve. And I think every district, district from the, in the last 50 years that has, has struggled with how to get kids engaged, it talks about parental involvement. And it's not easy, and there's a lot of parents. I know, you know both parents work, some people work two jobs. You have to do what you can in the school when, with the children when you have them there, um, and hope that they stay engaged when they go home. Um, so it's engagement and curriculum are, are the two things I think we have to say over and over again that we have the power to do that. This board, the superintendent, the administrators, the teachers, that's something we could all do without cost. Thank you. I agree that I think uh, keeping, keeping kids engaged is uh, one of the, the greatest examples. Um, my children both attend school here in Danbury, and we've watched the STEM program, which I think has been a tremendous experiment in what's going on, and I would love to see that experiment spread throughout the whole system, throughout the other middle schools, throughout the primary schools, the, there's um, a lot of new stuff happening at the high school, and I think that type of expansion and of course like everything it costs money to do that and the technology but I can tell you the just from watching my children go there and their their level of engagement and their they they like going there. They're they're impressed with their own school and it's it's a phenomenal change from when you know <laughs> when you're in a, in a situation where your, kid, your kids are in a classroom that's overcrowded, dealing with old technology or not enough books, and they're not learning, versus being in a situation where they're engaged and they want to learn. And parents' involvement and children's involvement in the school and in that technology, nothing would make me happier than see that, that system that they have their spider out throughout the whole system and, and work its way through over time. And it's going to be something that's going to take money, but it can be done over a period of years. And I would love to be here to help push that through and you know, find creative solutions to do it. I understand that nobody's going to come walking in and drop a billion dollars into the budget and, and redo everything. But slow change in a, in a direct pursuit of doing the right thing and keeping our students learning. And, Everybody's made comments about that. You can't let the kids get disengaged. They have to be engaged, and that will move everything 
in the right direction. I want to be a part of that. Thanks. All, all great ideas um, that, that, that the candidates have voiced. Um, the other one I really am uh, passionate about is, and, and I'm fortunate enough because my, both of my sons went to, uh, are still going to Great Plain, and I get to see uh, when I'm there the interaction between the teachers and the students. And, and, uh, to me, I think the teacher who spends an, a lot of time with the child throughout the day is one of the greatest impacts uh, and what molds our children when, when we're not doing that at home, um, or they're being coached into one of their activities or music. Um, so for me, I think that um, teachers uh, are the where the rubber meets the road, and they can make a boring subject um, enlightening, and they can make a, uh, a touchy subject um, understandable to the children, uh, whatever that issue may be. So for me. You know, I'm, I'm sold, I've, you know, again, I'm, I'm spoiled, I've, I've experienced great teachers throughout my children's experience at, you know, just at the, middle, uh, at the elementary level at this point. But, um, you know, engaging with the, with the teachers is really you know, a, a, a big part of it. Thank you. Well, my comments is I, I agree with everything that has been said, but I also believe that students must be engaged the activities. They must feel like if they make a comment that it's going to be appreciated when they make the comments, whether it's not the right comment that the teacher is looking for. Okay. And parental involvement. Now that's the biggest question. How do we get the parents when so many other things are going on and we can talk about Yes, they can be to this meeting, and they can be to the meeting. Parents just don't have that time now because they are all they are trying to take care of those financial needs that they need at home, and to make sure that their child gets to school and have the proper thing that they need. That question I've asked many, many times: How do we continue as a community to get our parents involved? And I've even tried the resource of going picking up people. And after a couple of times, it's good, one or two times, and then, you know, it sort of fades away. But everyone don't have that type of time, and everyone don't want to come out. Uh, they feel like, you know, that's not the right avenue I want to go. I'm not comfortable over there. But I, I truly believe that our students, the ones that I have been around all these years that I have been in Gambier, have to feel like whatever the, the question is that comes before them, whether it's a bad answer or not, that that teacher appreciates them. Anybody else? My, uh, my mother and father had a very simple philosophy. It starts at home. So we need the community relations, the parental involvement, and just to drive it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's some applause again for our first. <laughs> so, now what questions haven't been answered? What questions do you all have? Oh, great. So Keith? Hey. I don't need the mic. I'm Keith Gaylard. I'm an almost 30 year Denver resident. I used to be on the board of it until I had to move out of town. Now I'm back. I hear everybody say the exact same thing. I'm going to make a quick comment and then I'm going to ask a question. We all know we need funding. We all know that we need parental help. That's been going since the times the school started, way back when. But what are we going to do with our children? Have you engaged with the superintendent? Have you went to the schools? When I got on the Board of Ed, I personally wanted to meet all the teachers, all the staff, all the administrators and form a plan because they're the ones with the kids all the time. What can we do with these children? What can we do for our children? Everything else is there, funding, a gaps, everything's gonna come. But we have to deal with our children first. Yes, we have to get parents involved, but they can't get involved 
if we don't have input from our teacher to know what's needed to get them involved. So my question is, if you're elected, will you be going to the schools? Will you be talking to the teachers? Will you take and get with the PTO and talk to the parents to formulate a plan? We need to be one union. Every time I see, when I was on there at the beginning, it's political. This is not political. We want our children to be the best they can be. I don't have any children here. I'm doing it because I love the children and I'm passionate. So what do you want to do for us to help us get our kids going? Emmanuel? And I, I absolutely agree with you. This, this cannot be political. This has to be with the focus on the children. But um, I'll, I'll show you a personal story, okay? I came into the school system. I did not speak a word of English. I learned how to speak English in this building, at Mrs. Solomon's classroom. So I know exactly the value of a teacher in my life because I'll literally not be able to speak with you tonight if it was a front Cambrig school teacher. However, there is a big misconception in our community today. And when we're talking about overcrowding and we're talking about parent involvement, I'll bring out the elephant in the room. A lot of the times we're really saying that there's a lot of immigrant parents in our community who are not engaged in children's education. We need to think about this differently. We as a board need to come to the community. The community should not have to come to the board. I believe one of a very easy, concrete way for us to do this is, why don't we have traveling board meetings? Why aren't we having board meetings at schools like this? So that the parents can come and see how the process is done. Why don't we have that kind of a thing going where even if you are in a school where it's in a different part of town, where parents may not be all that involved, they can meet these officials and start having building relationships. So my answer to you would be one very simple thing. I think we should have mobile Board of Education meetings. I don't think we should be secluded to a room. I think that at least once every two months or whatever it is viable, um, that we should actually bring the board to the community and start fostering that kind of a relationship. And that way, the teachers in that specific school, the parents of that specific community, will start building direct line of communication. Because now it's not going to that big, scary administrative building. It's us in your community, it's in your school, where your children go to school every day. That's where we want to be. So that would be my concrete suggestion and response to your question. Thank you. I thought that was probably the best response, um, and I can't really top that. But um, I, I, part of it, too, is I would just add on to that and say that most of the open houses in our district are on different nights. And we could have, as board members and, and maybe, you know, administrators and others could, could be there, not necessarily to go on with all the drivel about rules that no parent wants to hear the hour-long presentation, but just be there, introduce ourselves, make ourselves available in the back of the room when they do that to school-wide, you know, open house, and then go off, you know, to the teacher's classrooms or whatever. Um, I think visibility really matters. I think that there's, uh, I'm, I didn't mention before, I'm on the board of directors for the Family Learning Center. There's a lot of parents that are intimidated, if they're immigrant or not, they're just intimidated by the process. Um, and they don't want it, they, they don't want to sit and talk about, you know, to, to people who are part of the process because they just, they don't know what to say, they don't know what questions to ask. Um, and if we just make it very visible that we're just all here and we're all part of the same collaborative project and getting these kids the best education, then we'll be more approachable. Um, and I, I do agree that sitting in a room in, in town school office, um, you're not going to encourage a lot of people who are nervous to just drive over there and show up, and especially if they don't have cars or they don't have time. So, um, you know, that's something that as a volunteer, you do have to give more time. It's not just about the meetings, it's about the presence. So, um, I thought it was a great response. I just want to add on to it. Daniel? I just assumed we did that. <laughs> no. No, you it's not done. No. I just assumed we did it. It's not done. When I got on the board, I was the first one to do it, according to other board members and administration. Okay. Me personally, as, a, as an elected official, and I know what my roles and responsibilities is as a board of education member. I will not enter into a school and meet with a teacher or a principal 
without going through the chain of commands, and that would be through the superintendent office. You can get yourself into a whole lot of unnecessary uh, bull stuff, if I can use the right language. If you're concerned about a program, you would ask the superintendent office to set up a meeting with those people of, uh, about the program that you're concerned about. You if it's about uh, if it's on. about community parental involvement or whatever is going on, then that meeting will come together. That's not my role as a board member to sit one on one with the teacher and find out what the problem is. And it's not my role. And I, I did this, and I truly believe for the last for the 24 years that I have been on the board. If I want to know something, I will make an appointment to make sure that what I'm interested in knowing about, I'm just, I'm just on the top of my head, let me just tell you about the, the, uh, the tree, the uh, curriculum tree that we have. I fully didn't understand that, okay? And I needed that to be explained to me. And I made an appointment with Dr. Glass to sit down with me, and we went over that. If there's something going on at Board or Rogers Park, I would do the same thing. Now, other board members, I don't see anything wrong with if you decide that you want to visit a school and find out what's going on in the school with the understanding that it's a particular curriculum or something, a question that you want to ask. That's not my role to go into the school and the teacher is trying to carry on her classroom, and I'm going to decide today I'm going to pop up at the school. No, that's not my role as a Board of Education member. You misunderstood me, Ms. Hooter. Okay. What well, happened explain was, it, just it was with the approval of the superintendent and the deputy superintendent, it was with the approval of the principal that we had designated time that we went through, and it wasn't just random. It was calculated and it was planned because I cannot vote as a board member, which is my duty to find out information about stuff on something that I don't even know about until I talk to the principal or the teacher about that issue. Okay. And it was I, all done okay. with approval. Okay, I, I understand that with approval. With approval. With approval. Yes. But exactly. also not alone. Never alone. I know my role, I know my place. As a board member, it's our responsibility to take and find out what the issues are. How can you vote on the issue if you don't know what it is? Just because the mayor says vote or just because somebody else says vote, if there's an issue, I want to know personally if I'm putting my John Hancock on this issue saying that this is what we should vote on, I want to know what the issue is and get an idea of what we can do to fix it. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but also if you, if you want to meet with the principal and the other people involved, why would you go to your principal and you have not had a conversation with your superintendent and I, say, not, I don't understand it? You didn't understand it. I understand I did talk to the superintendent and the okay. deputy superintendent okay. and asked about the issue. Okay. And I wanted to hear more than what they had to say. Okay. Just like if I had my boss, I'm going to ask my boss and there's somebody else that might know the same issue. So I can get both sides okay. of the issue. And I can take and do what I have to do. Mr. Gaylor, I truly understand where you're coming from. But again, I feel like what my role is as a board member, I truly believe that. But as a board member, that, that is part of your role. Okay. Right. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, guys. Thank Let's you. go on to the next question here. Hold on. I'm not running for the Board of Education. I do want to thank all of you for coming out because history is made by the people who show up. So I really appreciate you being here to answer questions and to talk about your philosophy. Oddly enough, I have something very similar to you. It's like this was a plan. Um, we would like to invite you to come to the schools. I am a teacher at Morris Street. I teach fourth grade. And we had a discussion about this with our Family Resource Center, which is right here, and our principal. And there was a time when the Board of Education members might come for a special event, uh, come to a PTO event, 
uh, come to a PTO meeting. Ours are the first Tuesday of each month. Um, I'm sure Dr. Sal would be more than happy to say, come on down. Our principal, William Sanasara, would love to see you. So my question is, given our invitation, given permission, could I just ask each one of you, could you find the time to come to a PTO event, come to a PTO meeting, come to actually visit the school once, let, let's say twice a year, twice a year, just like during session. You, sir. I just, again, I assume that we did that. Great assumption. So I'm, I'm, okay. I'm for it. Great, perfect. I, there was no doubt in my mind. You, sir. Yes, I would. Would you come? Yes, I would. I would I love to see you. Years past because my son attended Moore Street School. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And Mr. whether it be issue spotting or, or just mobile board of admin, it's a great idea. The wonderful ideas. Mr. Johnson. Absolutely. 100% on board. Right. Mr. Howell. I believe we currently do that to a certain extent, that each one of the current board members has a school. Exactly, I have a list. And which, which, exactly. So mine personally is to shelter out. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Horn, unfortunately she, she's retired, but she's known me quite well. That Great. I have had the opportunity to tour the, store, the, tour the school as well as attend their PTOs. Okay. Great. Uh, what we need to do, as a, if, you want, if you want to get community involvement, slash academics, or slash athletics, excuse me, and watch the tournament. So there's, we've got to jar these people. We've got to jar people in the community to say, listen, we, we need your involvement. So if we were to slash that athletics, let's see the tournament. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Amro. I'm a parent for the same child, one of the special needs children in the Denver district. And uh, I'm here today um, because I have a question for the people who hopefully going to be in the board. Does any one of you know what the process when a parent like myself doesn't get the services that he needs for his child? Because we, I heard a lot of conversation about lack of money, and we need to write to the, our uh, governor and legislators to obtain more money. I'm about to go to the state, tell them, then we does not deserve that money that you send to, for my child education because he doesn't get the services. So I want to be on board with you to help the Denver district instead of fighting it. So I would like to hear from each one of you if you know what the process is. Dad, wait. <laughs> I'm going to go. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, um, I, I do have, I have a stepdaughter that um, is not in this district, but another district, and I had to work as a special ed advocate knowing nothing about the process. Um, and one of the things that blows my mind about Connecticut is we have the money for the special ed services, and it seems to be, especially in this county, very hard to get it for the right students. Um, and I, have, I wish I could say that I had a good experience with the local district that I had to um, fight with. Um, and I, I almost decided to quit my job and become a special ed advocate because I realized I have a lot of- I'm about to do that. Right, I, I, do that. I should. <laughs> um, it, there's, it's unfair I to I my job last year. I, was, I used to make $200,000 a year. What? This year, I stopped. From all right? Because he needs me. Right. And here's the thing. I need to know if we can work together when you're on the board or not. Because I can be, next, the gentleman next to you, I can be writing a lot of letters and camping out to get money for the district. I also can volunteer my time to teach students, parents and bond. But in the same time, I cannot do this. I, we, I pay enough money in, in property taxes and the number of properties that I can have to put them in a very decent school. My federal taxes and my state taxes enough to put them in a very decent school. But the problem is, I'm not sure if I'm with you or against you. Right, and that's, 
like I said before, I, I see people like you who, who know, who are learning the process, um, and I, I think about what my background was and how difficult it was for me, a lawyer, to figure out how to advocate for special education, special education services for a child, and we had to go to a private um, evaluator because we weren't getting what we needed. And it, it horrified me to think that what about every other parent that doesn't have a law degree, that just has to advocate for their child with no support. Right. You have to pay for an advocate or a lawyer to sit down with you and go up against the board attorney or um, you know, and, and, and deal with the school psychologist. I get it. Um, but I also, I think that, and I don't know enough about the Danbury special ed program to say this, but I think that there are several districts that have a chronic misuse of those special ed funds that are there. Those fundings, the funding is there, the federal funds are there, the state funds are there. Um, they're not using the right resources for the right children and their needs. And I, I it's a frustrating experience. Um, I am a big believer in special ed and, and being able to provide the students the education that they need and the, the aids that they need and the accommodations that they need, and that's what the money is there for. And I don't think these districts are using it accordingly. They're making the parents jump through hoops that the whole system was created to avoid. Sorry, no. No. What, what's your name again, sir? My name is Emma. Mr. Emma, I, I'll tell you what. My son has autism, and he's three. What I can tell you is that that is you know, I'm not going to say it's a personal agenda of mine, but it's definitely the drive in my heart. When I look at my son, when I see what I experienced from birth to three, having 17 hours of therapy a week for my son, speech, OT, autism intervention, we graduated from birth to three, and now I'm still waiting for us to have access to one hour of one-on-one OT through the public school system. So I understand your frustration because I'll be honest with you, as a parent, I'm trying to understand it as well. Because now he's tripping again, and he wasn't tripping before. And he's having a hard time walking. So, what I can tell you from the bottom of my heart is that because my own child's future is on the line, I want to figure out why, because my son will be your son's age. So you have my commitment, and I truly understand what you're going through. And I commend you for being here tonight and for bringing your son. And I see how he's getting upset, that he sees that you're upset and he's just worried about you. So thank you for bringing that up, and I really appreciate you bringing your voice to our special needs families tonight. Thank you. I could. As a current Board of Education member, I do not know the policies and procedures. But I find it surprising, you know, as far as your comment in regard to, to lack of support from the administration or from the actual Board of Education. I will give you my email address at the end of this meeting. You contact me, I will guarantee you someone will be in touch with you. Good evening. Thank you for coming and, and letting us get a chance to meet with you. I am a parent of a child at the Magnet School. And recently, this spring, we had something voted in, actually this fall, kind of railroaded into our school. And I want to get your feeling for how are you going to support our administrators of the school? We have an award-winning principal with Dr. Natowski, who presented to the board last year how she wanted to maintain keeping sibling families together. This fall, we had a vote 6-3 against our principal. Two board members spoke very, very highly of our principal and stated, we let every other principal make these decisions for their school. We should really let this principal make the decision for the school. And unfortunately, we had six board members not vote with the principal, who had just been recognized that night for an award. I want to know, if you're going to talk to the principals of the schools for the changes that you plan to make, and I hope that you decide that they are the experts of their school and what they think is best for their environment. I'll tackle that one first one because first and foremost, I voted against it. And I felt, as a board member, the fair and equitable situation for all students within the city of Danbury 
should be an open lottery. Yep. That, 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 that the 50 or 55 sibling preferences took away from that open evaluation and, and fair policy. Plain and simple. But I am asking people who are running, would you pay attention to a principal who's presenting both sides of the story and who says, my school's future demands that you keep things the way they are? Because every other school has, every other elementary school has a sibling policy, whether you wanted to think of it or not. And when an award-winning principal of an award-winning school says, this will be detrimental to my environment, please do not change it. She is the expert. She has been there now 10 years. Are you going to listen to the expert of the school? Or if parents are upset that they didn't get in? That's what I want to know. We're going to listen to the principals and let them have the strongest voice and what's the impact for your school. Uh, I'll be honest, I never even thought about this issue until I, I you know, heard about it not that long ago. And I, I, I won't even think about it because my brother is, you know, 13 months younger than me. We've been inseparable growing up. Uh, I mean, I have a younger sister also, but, you know, particularly my brother. My, my sister was always in school after me. You know, we grew up in the schools together. You know, we both went to UConn. We were both on the cheerleading, cheerleading team together at UConn, always together. And we still spend a lot of time together. And my first instinct would be, you know, certainly we need to keep siblings together. Uh, you know, thinking about it a little bit more, I can understand the argument that, you know, maybe we got to open this opportunity up because there's only limited spots. Let's open it up to other individuals. And if a sibling gets in as well, great. And if they don't, you know, I mean, no way around it. It stinks. Um, but to answer your question, you know, I would love to hear what the principal has to say, what her perspective is. I mean, obviously we already know what her recommendation is, but I wasn't at the meeting. I don't know what, you know, the background is for her coming to that determination. I would, I would love to hear it, and I would certainly walk into it with an open mind because as a, you know, I'm trying to communicate, I really don't know what the answer would be, you know, right here off the bat. Right. That's, that's a tough one. Um, you know, during my professional day, I make decisions. I try to vet what the subject matter expert is telling me uh, with regard to maybe a technology issue we're embedding into a contract. It could be whatever. I rely upon those experts, um, but I also understand that there's a board, and the board has a sometimes a difficult difficult role. Now, I, you know, how how the board ruled and, and decided on that issue. Uh, I would think that they weighed both sides, they understood what the principal was saying, and they made a, a decision based on the, the facts that were presented to them and what they thought was going to be the best path forward for the, for the school district. So you're going to have winners and losers on that decision uh, one way or the other, the people that wanted to get in and then the families that were already there. It's not going to be an easy solution, other than we just raise money and build another magnet school, but that's not going to happen. Right, in the foreseeable future. So you just have to hope that the people that you're putting here will weigh it and they're going to be prepared to make a tough decision. Thank you. I, I, um, I agree with Dan very, I mean, in my career as well, I have to rely on other people because I'm not an expert of all things. And I'm definitely, you know, I was raised in an education family, but I'm definitely not an expert of your kids. I'm not an expert of, of curriculum. And I know that, I mean, some of us have education experience, but we have to rely on the principals. And we also have to make a decision that's best for the entire community, not just the kids that are in that school. Um, if I was sitting on the board then, I don't know what my decision would be. Um, because I'm a parent whose kid tried to get in and never could. And I also know that I don't want my kids in separate schools, because how are you supposed to get them from place to place? Um, but I think that one of the things that we have to do is give some you know, support to our teachers and our administrators that we're not really giving them now. Um, I mean, they're they're working very hard. Teachers are kind of like on the block right now. They're getting frustrated. Things are being thrown at them to make them meet certain goals that are rigid and honestly fairly stupid in some in some of these goals. And they, <laughs> um, these teachers and these administrators are trying to do the best thing for their kids, and they've spent their entire careers 
I mean, maybe there's a couple bad ones here and there, but they've spent their entire careers trying to do what's right for these children. Some of them aren't paid well, some of them aren't treated well, some of them are yelled at parents from time to time. But if they're standing in front of me and pleading that they know their kids and they know their schools and they've, they've brought their schools to a blue ribbon status and this is what they believe, then I think as a board, or as human beings, we have to say, I, I, can't, I can't argue with that. I can present all the evidence and we can make a financial decision, but we have to be supportive of these principals and these administrators as much as we can. And, and actually think about what they're saying as much as we can as well. So I, I do, I would give them as much preference as I could, but also realize that we're supposed to act in the entire district as well. And that's got to be part of our decision, and that's got to be part of our process, but I don't think that we could ever sit here and say that we know better um, based on their own experience and expertise. Thank you. Direct answer to your question, yes. I think we should listen to school administrators and, and really use um, their track history of success as a measure of how good is a decision. I also think that just as we talked about with the overcrowding population, um, some of these events are fluid and not necessarily mandated to be repeated in time. So one school year, you may have a lot of siblings, Another school year may not. So we also have to factor that into the decisions that we're making so that we're not making one rigid rule that doesn't fluctuate with the need of that school or that family. Um, but I think that it's extremely important for us to look at, and, and your question kind of just sparked something in my mind. We have some really wonderful gems in our school system. Some principals and schools, they're getting awards, and they're doing things that are really, really good and being recognized statewide and also nationally. Um, and we need to find a way to connect these dots and replicate these programs across the school system. You know, I think about Ms. Julia Horn. You know, she achieved 100% parental involvement in her school 20 years in a row. There's something there, there's a method. Why can't we just make that method one that we try to replicate in other schools? You know, you, you spoke about your principal. What is in that curriculum? What are the ways that we can kind of try to meld these great success stories together and make sure that we try to replicate them in other schools across our system? So thank you for that comment, and, and I think that yes, we should defer to the experts to tell us what our children's needs are. And one thing that Ms. Horn said this week when she was honored, I think it was last week I was at, at the event, she said that the first educator she came across when she started in our school system told her, if you make it about the kids, you can never go wrong. Don't worry about making the janitor upset, don't worry about making the teacher upset, don't worry about making the superintendent upset, don't worry about making anybody upset. If you worry about the kids first, you can never go wrong. And I think that we should try our very best, all of us, whoever gets in, to do so. To just first think of the children and families and then go from there. Any one question up here? Huh? I'm sorry, can you compassion? Oh, Patrick, did you want to, did you want to talk about that one? Sure. I, I Great. Thought pretty, I thought it was pretty well covered. I've been on, <laughs> I've been on several, several boards. I've been on the Zoning Commission. I've been on the Planning Commission. Um, to be honest with you, that's our job. You make decisions. And you're presented with the with both sides of an argument, and the idea behind electing anybody up here is to think that you're going to elect somebody who's going to think along the same lines that you do. Um, he, uh, he, for me to sit up here and say that I would go against the principal or I would go for the principal without having heard any of the argument is a little difficult for me to do right now. I wouldn't seek to undermine that person, but I. In all of my experience in being on any board, you detailed, listened, and took notes as to every side of each argument. And then my job is to sit down and make the best decision that I can based upon the evidence that's put in front of me. And I've done that. I do it now on the Planning Commission. I did, did it on the Planning Commission. I plan on doing it here. I, I do not ever go off of having somebody else to say, oh, vote for this. That's not the way I do things. And I would never do that. So that's, that's pretty much it. I'll listen to it and weigh it out and make the best decision that I think I can. 
Uh, to the young lady, I want to thank you uh, for asking the question, and I most certainly would and did. I attended the two workshops for the magnet school, and we have to also realize, you know, when it comes to voting, we have, it's a six to five majority. So I, I truly understand if one vote or two people did not support it or three. I had really made up my mind that I was going to support it until I had the conversation with the principal. And I knew that she would not bring me any type of false information. But when you're in this position, there are, uh, how can I say, I can't think of the right word. There, you, you, you think about it, you weigh the outcome. And I had originally had made up my mind that uh, I was going to not support the civilian purpose. And then after I had a conversation with her, and then some other things came out, I was going to support it. But unfortunately, I had my first grandchild, and I did not attend the meeting. I know. Okay? Know I okay. appreciate but, And I certainly appreciate the answer the question. Um, forgive me if I have to check my notes because I took some during the presentation. Um, I am a Danbury teacher and a Danbury taxpayer. Um, I have a comment, sorry, sorry. I have a comment and a question. My first comment is that I appreciate that you are um, looking to increase parent outreach and uh, getting parents involved because in my opinion, um, the parent is the first teacher and the responsibility of the parents um, to instill in their kids a passion for learning and an ever-increasing work ethic, which seems to be lacking in so many kids these days, um, should be their primary responsibility. It doesn't cost any money to sit with your child each night and read books. It doesn't cost any money to get them in bed at a decent hour. And it doesn't cost any money um, to instill that work ethic and that passion for learning. With that being said, my question is, uh, teachers are in the classroom daily, and they see how effective the curriculum and policies are with students. How do you view the teacher's role in education? And if elected, how supportive will you be when it comes to hearing teachers out and making changes to curriculum and policies? Can I handle that one first? Um, you know, I, I've seen some things in other districts um, that I find remarkable. And one of them is, is that teachers have to be part of the process. Otherwise, it's not going to work because they're the ones that are there with the kids. Um, one of the things I've viewed in another district is um, the superintendent will have a book club with administrators. And they come back and they chat, try to find things that are either articles or speeches or books or things that are um, increasing or bringing new ideas to the table as far as education. And then those administrators go back to the teachers and have town hall meetings with their teachers. These are not throwing out these professional development facts. This is a town hall meeting where the teachers are giving the same information these, these administrators are, and they're all creative process information series. It's sitting down in a room with all the teachers and talking things out and trying to find ways to make your school better. I've seen this. I, I, it works. It makes the teachers feel like they're not um, getting frustrated with the process because they're actually part of it. And it also, what Gladys said earlier about kids needing to be heard, um, makes them involved in the process and makes them engage. It's the same thing with us as adults too. If we're not being appreciated in our job, no matter how much we love our students and we love our kids, we're going to get frustrated and we're going to not want to work as hard. And I believe that by administrators and teachers and from this, all the way up to the superintendent, by having those discussions and having them be free-flowing, you're increasing the ability for teachers to be creative and be part of the curriculum itself. And it ha curriculum is different in every school district with every group of kids, and we have to acknowledge that. Our curriculum is going to be, we have certain goals, but how we're going to teach our kids might be very different than how, you know, Brookfield teaches their kids. I mean, we have a different dynamic, we have different teachers, we have different things to bring to the table. And if we do everything without engaging the teachers in the process and getting their ideas, then it's just going to be cookie cutter and it's not going to work. So that's my response. I think um, that teachers are the front line. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a worker at I'm the hydroelectric dams. I'm a field worker. I'm an electrician. I have my hands on the equipment. I'm 
on the field and the annoyance, no disrespect to the people up above, but when orders come down from way up above from people who actually aren't looking at what's going on and they're telling me how I'm supposed to do it, sometimes it's very frustrating. And obviously the people who know the best about what's going on in the classroom, in the, in the classroom, are the teachers. And I personally think that that is the best line, to sit down and to have meetings with the teachers and to hear their input. Um, like I said, I haven't been on the board. I don't know the, the intricacies of how it works, but like I said before, I'd be more than happy to volunteer to sit down at PTO meetings or sit down at a meeting after school with a, with a group of teachers and hear what they have to say and bring that up because that's how I work. I don't sit in office. I'm out on the front line and I think that's where you get your best input. That information gets handed up the line and, and disseminated and put to good use. And if those people are ignored, then the process falls down. That's, uh, so I would be more than thrilled to work with the teachers. Thank you. Like a good organization, I think it starts with the culture. So I think that there, there's an open transparency between the board, the teachers, and it's, a, it's fostered in openness. Um, I think that's really the way you're gonna get things started. You're gonna hear things and you're gonna be able to react a lot quicker. So again, I'm not part of the, the board today, so I don't know what that culture is like. Um, but, you know, with the, um, as a delegate on the Lake Authority, um, we have a, a culture with all of the Marine patrols, with the Lake Patrolmen. Um, we do, uh, uh, we have a rake and bake, or, you know, we, we make them dinner uh, next week, or, or a couple of weeks, where we'll, we'll bring them in. Um, we, we go out for patrol rides. So we get involved, uh, and we hear things, and we, and we adjust, and we make that, that, and I think that kind of stems from the culture. So for me, it's really a cultural, you know, what? Since I have been on the board, and I think most recently in the last five to 10 years, this board motto has been, whenever it came to budget cuts, our teachers are our top priority. And we want to keep our teachers in the classroom. So to me, that discussion has always been with the board and the superintendent. And um, sure, surely uh, we support our teachers. Because look at all the beautiful things that have came out of all the teachers uh, in, in uh, our community. Well, this, this young man is a part of Danbury School System. She's a part of the Danbury School System. So yes. Our motto has been to keep our teachers in the classroom. To, um, to add to what everyone's saying, um, and, and just taking more of a, of a business perspective on it as well, um, you have the post. You know exactly what needs to be done. And I think that a lot of the talks around education and curriculum, and I am going to say the T word, and testing, and all of these things um, have gotten so convoluted that they shy away from the pulse. And I think that it's very important that we listen to what teachers are experiencing in the classroom, to how they're interacting, but most importantly also, that we're careful with just trying to look for different ways that other districts are doing things without recognizing how unique our district is. And maybe there's unique ideas within our district, and not so much just looking for outside experts of how to deal with that, because our district is very unique. The diversity we have in our different schools is very unique. So um, you did make a point in your comment that a parent is a child's first teacher. And I think that one of the most incredible areas of impact that we could have is to really bring that message to our Latino families, for them to understand the importance of, yes, sitting down with your child in the end of the day and reading a book. Um, when I was able to serve on this um, task force to evaluate how we're educating English language learners in our state, one of the different models that we heard about, it's a blended model, where the language that the child has at that moment is actually used as a tool to impulse them into learning. And I think that whether we're talking about that parent reading a book in Spanish to their child, 
or reading a book in Portuguese to a child, or in English, that's still encouraging a lot of, the, of reading and learning. So we have to think about these different ways of engagement and meet people where they are, whether it's meeting them where they are financially, whether it's meeting them where they are in language acquisition of their own journey as a parent, but that should not be an excuse for not getting involved. And, and these are the things I'm really passionate about, and I'd love to hear more about the teachers, how we can work on that. But I think that getting parents to the table, and I keep going back to the 40% because that's a big number. And I know it's a big number reflecting each and every one of your classrooms. I would love to help the district with that. A uh, couple things real quick. Uh, first of all, uh, I had said earlier that I had spent some time substitute teaching uh, out of law school. And I thought it was an unbelievable experience just getting the opportunity to um, work with teachers, take over for teachers in their classroom, and get a chance to see the different schools all across the district. Uh, I recommend it to all my friends who you know are just starting to settle down, you know, buy houses, you know, have kids. And I, I always tell them, hey, listen, you, you need to get around to the different schools. I uh, think you have awesome opportunities to just substitute teach, go through the schools. You know, not just the schools that your kids might be going through, but, but all the schools. I mean, it gives you a great chance to see the different um, different issues that you know, the teachers have to deal with on a daily basis. And, and so, um, I think it's very easy, you know, sometimes to to criticize or, or butt heads with teachers, you know, whether it's the parent or the board of education, or whatever. Um, but you know, once you, you have an opportunity to stand in the shoes and see how it is. Uh, you know, it gives you a little bit of insight into things, and I'm not even going to pretend that, you know, I know what it's like day to day to be a teacher, but, you know, it's, it definitely gives you an insight into things. Another thing, too, uh, my brother, Bob, who I mentioned before, uh, you know, well, he just got his master's, and he's been subbing around looking for a job in, uh, in the school system. Uh, first call I, I made, you know, to talk about some of the issues here in Danbury, was to him, and I mean, the guy is good for nothing sometimes. He didn't really give me much to talk about, but I mean, the one thing that I really took from what he said to me is that, you know, a lot of the teachers complain about, you know, having to get taken out of the classrooms a lot to deal with different meetings during the day. And, you know, I mean, that's not something I can necessarily deal with, or, you know, solve right off the bat, but I think, you know, when that's one of the biggest problems a teacher has, you know, getting pulled out of the classroom, and not being able to spend more time with their students or spend the time that, you know, the limited time that they have, and it really goes to show you that, you know, teachers have the best intentions for their students and they want what's best for them. Um, now, that being said, I'd be a liar if I said, for every decision, I'm always inside by the principal or the teachers. You know, I, I can't take that position because at the end of the day, there's a lot of moving parts in the school system. You want to make sure everybody's interests are being looked out for and you want to weigh the different pros and cons and make sure that the best decision is being made, or at least what we, what we feel is the best decision, you know, based on the information that we have. Um, it might not always work out to be the best decision, but, you know, I'm sure everybody that's currently on the Board of Education has the best intentions as well, whether they're listening to the principals or the teachers or the parents, you know, those people are there for a reason. So it's a big time commitment just like teachers, you know, being a teacher is a big commitment, and they're just trying to do what's best, and, you know, that's, that's pretty much all I can say about it. Okay, thank you. We have one last question, and then um, we're going to close the meeting down, and uh, anybody who wants to talk to the candidates one-on-one, we'll have time to do that. Um, I think I have a pretty good voice. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I am Stella. Um, I have uh, three children in the Denver Public Schools, I work at um, one of the schools within the Denver Public School. And um, I have to say, we have a lot of resources. We have a lot of great um, resources within our Denver Public Schools. We have the Family Learning Center. We have, obviously, the Family Resource Centers. Um, we have the school readiness programs that you know help the early childhood, the, the children um, that need that, um, you know, that pre-K, that, that investment in early education so that when they come to kindergarten, you know, they, they have a little bit of what they need to know, uh, a lot of the educational um, uh, information. The, one of the um, concerns that I have is definitely parent engagement, parent involvement. You know, we keep using different words. Sometimes we use involvement. 
someone we use, sometimes we use engagement. Um, definitely like, uh, the language barrier, sometimes it's a little bit difficult. Um, I would, uh, and, and I see it even now, I mean, I see that we have, an, unless you get a translator, and sometimes I translate, and let me tell you, it, it's not that easy, because you do not want to do a disservice to the people that are presenting. So you don't want to twist any words, you don't want to come up with a word that maybe they don't want to use. So it's definitely not that simple. So maybe, and I don't know if, if it already exists, is have something um, available when you have board of ed meetings, when you have meetings as important as this, so that our parents know that prior to those home that says, there will be you know, translation, or there will be headphones, so there's going to be something. So our parents know, our parents that need that help. They know that they can come, they can listen, and really hear what's being said. Um, so I said two things, I, I talked a little bit about early childhood, I, you know, it's near and dear to me. Um, I work with um, uh, the Family Research Center, we have play groups and home visits, that's huge for us. These are the children that are coming to kindergarten. And surprisingly enough, you know, these early childhood programs are not a line uh, budget item um, within the Board of Ed budget. There, there's no line item for the Family Resource Center, Family Learning Center, and the School Readiness Program. And there's, you know, there's a lot of us that are, are um, working within those groups. So I think what I'm saying is that really I would like for you to consider when having um, this kind of meetings that are very important, and we want the parents to come, we want them to know that they can come and there's going to be services provided for them. I'm gonna jump on that one. <laughs> Um, I, I am um, fluent in Portuguese, and um, I do also speak Spanish, and um, it's very difficult to learn three languages, and it's very difficult to maintain language, and that's why it's very difficult to translate, so I appreciate your comment, and especially in the quality of translation, especially on very convoluted and, and complex issues, it's what I do for work managing and editing um, and leading a trilingual publication. I'm constantly dealing with language and translation. Um, but I think what you, you hit on a key point. Um, when we know the makeup of our community, and we know the makeup of our school system, and we know that we use a certain ways to communicate, we're really only communicating with 60%, we're leaving 40% out. So having a translator present in any official meeting um, so that these parents if, they, if we are so successful in getting them to want to be involved or engaged, whichever word we want to use, that there is a tool in the way. Um, we can't wait for people to acquire language in order for them to speak for themselves because your children are growing and every year we're losing a major opportunity in advancing them in their love of learning. So we need to catch parents where they are, meet families where they are in order to get them to understand how they play a very, very integral role in the achievement of their children. And that's really dear to my heart, especially with the immigrant parents, because I'll tell you right off the bat, I am someone who obviously, I care a lot about education. I think it's extremely important. It changed my life. My parents would go to a PTO meeting. And I mean that with all the respect to, to the PTO um, you know, representatives that are here, they didn't feel that that was a place that they were, that they would fit in, quite frankly. You know, it, it's, it's not something that we're used to culturally. So there's certain things that we may have to adjust along the way to really achieve that goal of engagement. And that's why I go back to Ms. Julia Horn, because she tried a bunch of different things. And at the end of the day, what really worked was she just met people where they were. And I think that if we do that, we're going to be able to see some actual solid outcomes in children and their achievement by just bringing the parents to the table and giving them the tools and meeting them where they are and engaging them in their role in their children's education. So thank you for that comment. I totally agree with you. And I, I would love to help, especially using my language skills to be able to be that direct bridge where parents know they have, that there will be a board member that can actually come and speak to me directly in the language you're most comfortable with.
any comments? I mean, I'll just make another Great. comment quickly. Um, my first language wasn't English, it was Arabic. Uh, my mom doesn't even have a high school education. My dad has a master's in electromechanical engineering. And, uh, you know, growing up, my parents were very active in, in, you know, in our education. Um, my mom stayed at home and raised us, and when we were old enough, you know, she went to work and eventually worked, you know, for the, as a school bus driver and then retired. Um, she, she didn't participate in the PTO or in functions like this, neither did my dad. I think there's something that has to do with culturally, you know, just, I don't know if they didn't feel comfortable, they didn't know what to do. Uh, I certainly agree that we should be a lot more welcoming and, and try and incorporate, you know, different, different individuals who might feel, for whatever reason, there's barriers to them participating. Uh, and one thing I did notice, I and mean, today I was looking through all the different websites and the different schools, taking a look, uh, I did see a couple of, you know, principal's letters or, you know, notices to parents that, that were in other languages, which I never even thought of and I applauded. I thought it was, was a great idea, especially with technology, you know, it's a little bit easier to sometimes translate things. I mean, there's no reason why it shouldn't happen. And, and certainly having translators at, at functions, you know, would, would be a, a good idea. I just want to add one thing. I mean, um, I think Manuela and, and Frank really said it well, but the other thing too is to also not assume that people can make it to functions in person as well. And using the resources and technology we have, if it's if it's an you know after meeting translation that we can somehow get to people, um, because I think that it's very hard. I know it's not always easy for most of my friends to be at a meeting at seven o'clock. Um, one parent's working, one parent you know you're not bringing the kids with you, so it's. And not everybody has two parents at home. So I think that we also have to assume, you know, we know from experience in our district and districts everywhere that yes, you do have to go out to the people where they are. And technology gives us that bridge. Um, so it's not necessarily having a principal driving a car anymore and not gonna teach you in a parent's door. It's that we can use what we can to you know, physically get in their house and talk to them without physically being there. So um, finding those resources and working together and coming up with ideas to, to allow these parents to, to know what's going on at a comfort level that they, they feel like they can be part of the process and they're not scared off um, and engage them more, I think is critical, absolutely. Great, thank you. So we want to close the general meeting here and we want to thank um, Dr. Sal for being here with us tonight and all of our candidates. Don't you wish we had to vote for all of them? For all of them.